But with AI and technology, all of that is changed. Mm. All of that has completely changed because you can have an organization that's completely flat. CEO, workers, that's it. So what kind of career ladder would you have? It's just one step. Change has never been faster than it is today. Software has eaten the world. Software, I would argue, has overthrown industries. Some might even say that it has disrupted free democracies. And all of these changes force us to ask ourselves the hard questions. To wonder, okay, what is it that we as human beings do better than machines? What is it that we as human beings bring to the table that is unique and that will not be disrupted tomorrow and that won't turn into a commodity? So I'll be your host for tonight. I'm Nikolai. I'm an AI engineer by training. I was uh, doing AI programming in the early 2000s, way before it was cool, when everybody told me it was a terrible idea to work in artificial intelligence. Uh, so this is a subject that's very dear to my heart. Um, and I'm not going to bore you right now with my vision on general artificial intelligence. And I won't immediately share my opinion on whether or not the robot overlords will be here soon and whether or not I will serve them and welcome them with open arms. But I can pretty much guarantee you this. We don't need general artificial intelligence. We don't need robots running around in the streets to profoundly change the way we run our societies and the way we live our lives. Just to give you a quick example, like if you look at the things that have profoundly changed the ways in which we think about science, for example, in which we define what we consider to be truth, how vaccines work, right? Uh, whether or not we should be part of a union of other countries. All of these changes have been brought about by very simple AI algorithms designed only to optimize engagement in a stream of content. If you look at the economic changes that we've been going through, a lot of those have been caused by simple AI algorithms, just you know, serving to optimize profits for companies and for traders. So my argument for tonight will be that we don't need general artificial intelligence. Change is coming and it's bigger than you think. And I'm very happy to be having this discussion here today with two fantastic guests. Uh, so Ling Ling Tai, uh, who is a solopreneur, who has a decade-long global experience in uh, learning and development and who today helps organizations foster a learning culture and helps them deal with the accelerating rate of technological change and helps them increase engagement with their employees. And I'm profoundly convinced that these are topics that will become more and more important as artificial intelligence takes hold in our society. There's Bernard Goldstein, who has written this book, duality, in which he talks about how we may best prepare ourselves and our children for what's coming in the, the age of artificial intelligence. He also has a company, Sharper AI, um, and I'm very happy to welcome you here both today. So if I can get a warm welcome, please, for these two amazing <laughs> guests. So I'd like to get tonight started by asking each of my guests uh, to give sort of an opening statement around a question that I'd like to ask. Now, you, Ling Ling, you're an expert in learning and development. That's right. You, you're an expert in helping organizations deal with fast technolog technological change, and that change is going to get ever faster. Yeah, that's great. How do you think that will impact the way we work and the way we learn? Just as how you have mentioned earlier, it'll impact everything that we do from the way we learn, from the way we work. So thank you so much, La French Tech, and thank you so much, WeWork, for inviting me here for the panel. And just a little bit of a background for me, you know, why am I into tech? And like you, Nikolai, I come from a tech background. I had a degree in electronics engineering and worked for a semiconductor manufacturing IT tech company for a while. Before I decided that's not where I want to be, I want to be helping people. And especially around technology, when things are moving and changing so fast, technology has become made us more accessible, made things a lot more mobile, but yet the people have to learn how to adapt to using this technology. And this is the space where I help organizations and people to learn how to use technology for their own learning and for enhancing and optimizing how their performance in the workplace. 
There must be a lot of demand for those kinds of services right now, right? Because it seems to me like everybody is asking themselves those questions, both individuals and organizations. Well, some organizations still have the traditional mindset because when yeah. I go out <laughs> to some organizations and say, hey, I do learning and development right. a as a professional service, the first thing they come to mind is, oh, you give training. Uh, uh, we need to gather people in a classroom and somebody who is the body of all knowledge will stand up in front of people and impart that knowledge from that person. That is the traditional way of training. But these organizations don't realize with technology in place that's not how we're going to learn anymore. Mm -hmm. It's too slow to want to gather people in a classroom, too slow to look for an expert, have them in a class and to train people. Now learning can be done at any time and anywhere and at any skill. You, you, that's just amazing. Yeah. You can have so much control as an individual on how you want to create your own learning. And I believe how you learn will also shape your career, will also shape your organization. So a lot of companies still have that traditional mindset. You m you'd be surprised. Mm. That's very interesting that you say that. It's all about that rate of change, right? It's like they're not, they're just not able to keep up. Like it's going so fast, they're stuck 10 years in the past. Yeah. And, even, and that's such a big difference. Like even when you ask yourself about technological change, right? The rate of change. Think about your iPhone. This wasn't around in 2006. Can you imagine not having an iPhone? And just this is something that we'll be discussing later, right? Even we would never have imagined that having an iPhone would create new jobs, new industries. Like when I was, w when I was studying AI, God, the app developer it didn't exist. Like yeah. We could only dream of these kinds of devices. Right? And like you said, it's because of the smartphone, things are sta yeah. have started to change. I remember the time when iPhones was introduced to my friends. That was, what, 10 years ago? I was yeah, still yeah. using that flip phone. If, if yeah, me too. Me. I thought yeah. that flip phone was really fancy. You know, it has all the bells and whistles and lights on it. But <coughs> even back then, 10 years ago, when people had that smartphone, I still had that flip yeah. phone. We had that problem with people looking at their screens yeah, yeah, at yeah. the dinner table. And I, it w I was completely alien to it. But now it's very common. Yeah. You have all this information right in your hands. And with that information, what do you do with it? What right. do you what do, do, you do with it? How do you leverage it? How do you do something useful? Yeah. How do you do something other than just consume, right? Yes. And this is where learning has become accessible. It's become mobile. We can do it all the time, every single minute, learn and build our own careers. We don't have to wait for some HR person to give you a schedule. Hey, let's go to this meeting room because you've hired an yeah. expert to come in and train. We don't need to do that anymore. In fact, we don't even need to wait for HR to tell us if you want to be promoted to a certain position, you need certain skills. We're the ones who decide yeah. what skills we want and build the careers that we want. Or corporate training, right? You don't have to wait for corporate training to be assigned to you, to be lucky enough to win yeah. some hours of corporate training because you're co constantly upping your skills to become more competitive in the job market. Exactly, yes. There's so much of power to the individual now that people aren't aware of. So that's what I, I like about I think that's a really place. positive note uh, mm -hmm. to end this opening statement on, right? It empowers the individual and it allows you to go much faster than we might have gone before to learn things, to enrich your lives, assuming you can get out of consumption mode. I think that's the big challenge. Yeah, and this is where I have to come in and tell people that yeah. or show them that we can use technology in a different way and not just for consumption, not just for online shopping or ordering food or ordering your grab. There's so much more you can do with that. And I think what is more difficult now than before is the rate of change you're talking about. People are caught by surprise that, oh, my job no longer exists. Yeah. But if you know, like back in the day, 10 years ago, I was working in manufacturing. It's actually really common back then for people's jobs to be replaced by automation. So I was in, mm -hmm. in different teams helping people look for different jobs, doing change management. Uh, and a lot of my colleagues 10 years back have moved on and gotten different jobs. So they have evolved yeah, sure. themselves. Yeah. They went into the police force, law enforcement, government, nonprofit. We can wow, survive yeah. change. Yeah. We can all do it. But what is more surprising now is that it catches us by surprise because of the mm. speed of it. But unless we prepare for it, right? And that's where Benar comes in. So in your book, you talk about how we can prepare ourselves and our children for what's coming, for the age of AI. Um, and you mention, and it's something that really stood out to me as a dad of a young child, that it's important for our children to learn the right things. That's correct. Could you tell <laughs> us a little bit more about that? Sure, um, I can try. 
it's it's a very hard question yeah yeah it is yeah and and even harder is the work of educators today educators have to equip children with tools concepts material that will need to remain valid relevant and useful for the next 20 years until they complete school and universities and hopefully afterwards right essentially we ask educators to prepare children for jobs which may very well not exist today yeah yeah and for a future which is highly uncertain right the one thing we can anticipate however is that artificial intelligence will probably play a role which will be even more important than today maybe a dominant role and you don't want to compete with AI. If you are on a construction site today, you wouldn't want to compete with a crane when it comes to lifting heavy material, right? You don't want to compete with a memory stick when it comes to memorizing terabytes of information. And if you want to travel fast and quickly, you will not want to compete with airplanes. So the same holds true with artificial intelligence there is an increasing number of domains and fields where artificial intelligence simply outperforms humans. And we have to take this into account and strategize and adapt, as you, as you were um, saying. Yeah. So, in my view, um, with regards to, to artificial intelligence, there are really three things children and even grown-ups should learn. First of all, we should learn to use artificial intelligence, because after all, it's going to be extremely beneficial to society. This is why we created it in the first place. We should also learn to protect from it, because it is a very powerful general purpose technology. And like this type of technology, it's always double-edged, double-sided, and we need to exercise caution. And we must also learn to differentiate from it. Why? Because one of the promises of artificial intelligence is precisely to take the machine out of the human so that the humanity in us can blossom but you have to nurture it so how how do we learn all of this i introduced um, a framework which i called the 21st century compass as a compass it helps us navigate really the new world um, it's an education referential this is how i put it at the center of the compass, the core, we have the ability to learn. Because learning to learn in an environment that is rapidly changing is, is, is a key capability. At the bottom of the compass, you will find foundational knowledge. Literacy, numeracy, digital literacy. Digital literacy is not coding. It's the ability to use wisely digital tools, including artificial intelligence. On the sides of the compass, you will find two sets of skills. One is the cognitive skills, including, including um, critical thinking to help us decide you know, what to think and what to do. Creative thinking, because a new world requires new solutions. And interdisciplinary thinking, because the subjects, as we sometimes learn them at school and university, um, they're just too narrow to reflect the complexity of the world and to help us comprehend it. And on the other side, the non-cognitive skills, sometimes referred to as social-emotional skills, include, for instance, resilience, our ability to bounce back, you know, after setback, empathy, because the capability to spot and to properly respond to someone's uh, feelings is the foundation of a human relationship. And then you have collaborative skills, because in today's world, nothing comes out just of a, of a singular effort. And last, the needle of the compass points to what I call the moral north. There's ethics, which really delimits the roads that we are willing to take, or that we find are acceptable to take. And we have purpose, which helps us define the mission that we think 
we have on earth. And this is particularly important in times of uncertainty and instability. So this is my version of the 21st century compass. There's some overlap with what yeah. many people call 21st century competencies. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, in yeah. my mind, this is what children should learn, and it's definitely not what right. they learn at school in general. Yeah, exactly. It's completely different from what they're learning today, right? So that's a very interesting thing to note. And what you're, what you're saying, that this is about preparing the future generation, right? So, but, but let me bring it back to us, right? So let's for a moment, and I'd like to discuss all three of us uh, on this question. So, right, that, that, that's all nice, right? That's great that we can prepare our children, but apparently AI is, is going to disrupt our jobs, right? It's going to disrupt the way we work. And even us podcasters, we might soon be out of mm. a job, God forbid. Um, <laughs> so how do we prepare for that? What do we do? Hmm. Um, would you like to start with an opening sure. statement? or? I think it really depends on the granularity and the time horizon that you look at. Okay, yeah. If you look at individuals like us and the short term, the best way to prepare in my mind is precisely to try and acquire those 21st century competencies for sure. sure. Now if you look at society as a whole and if you take the medium term or the longer term, in my view again, there's only one sensible way to prepare. And this is just to pave the way for a radical societal change, starting with how we decide to redistribute wealth. Oh, if yeah, we I mean. Don't do that. S since even you, podcasters, might disappear, what will you do? Yeah, God. If we continue to base your, in your, your, well your, your income sorry, on your job, and if your job yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Right? Well, how do you distribute wealth? Well, that's all already a massive problem, right, in today's society. Wealth redistribution, distribution, uh, the accumulation of wealth in the top 1% and how it will be ever increasing in the 10 years to come. If you add work disruption to that, it's a recipe for disaster, right? Mm. Yeah, most, most definitely. I don't know how the wealth distribution would happen because even without AI, there's all these factors you need to consider as well mm. in terms yeah. of the politics, how mm. government run their policies, the will of the people. All of yes. that will have to come <laughs> into play too. Should we redistribute the wealth the yeah, the give wealth it to all the robots? To me. Or <laughs> is that the best solution? Let them redistribute it if it ever gets there? Let robots do it? Yeah. Do you even trust robots? I don't know. Do you know. even trust AI to do it? It's, it's human to not to entirely trust robots, mm -hmm. I think. I think what's, what's interesting in what you're saying mm -hmm. is that it's, n it's no easy uh, yeah. task, right? We, we all agree with this. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have to start thinking about it today. Because it might take one generation, two generations, three generations before we start accepting this. There are many places, including in our beautiful country, France, there are many French people here, where universal basic income to call it you know uh to call it to call a spade a spade i think that's, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how you, you say is still perceived as paying people for doing nothing basically yeah and many people think this is a communist measure or this is socialist right while it is uh, proposed really by uh, the silicon valley mm. right and liberal economists so there is um, a perception that will take a very, very, very long time uh, to modify. And this is why we ne really need to start today. And by the way, to all the difficulties that you, that you have mentioned, I'd like to uh, add here, and sorry for that, I'd like to add climate change. And I will, yeah. I will tell you why, because the populations who will suffer from one are also possibly the ones that will suffer from the other. Now, if you look at climate change, you know, uh, in the 70s, there were people who knew. Not many, but there were some. They were not listened to. And then people want, didn't want to accept. And then people didn't believe. And then they didn't want to act. So today, we have <laughs> the feeling, you know, it's that it's with same, artificial right? intelligence, we have the feeling that it's not at all uh, the same conversation because it's of our own making. We are yeah, in control, yeah, etc. Yeah. But in the 70s, we were also in control. Right? And now, for climate change, no one is in control anymore. Well, Mitigation is going to be difficult and adaptation painful. 
for I mean, everyone. I mean, so yeah. let me be pessimistic here. I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I'm both very pessimistic and optimistic uh, on, on these things. Cli I think climate change perfectly illustrates that we won't do anything, right? Not until it's too late, mm. unless it's directly in, unless it directly benefits uh, profit generation for corporations and other economic stakeholders. Um, so, for example, if you look at um, where we're heading now with climate change in this post-truth era, people are still saying it's a hoax, right? Mm. People are leaders of the free world are publicly stating that other that 30 years of science is just untruth, and that this is all a conspiracy by some other country, right? Mm. Which is insanity. And even if nobody believes that to be true, it influences public opinion because science shows that if you're exposed to opinions even if they're false they will influence your own opinion how can you expect a society that refuses to protect its own existence that is at risk because of climate change to protect its own well comfort the comfort of the poor the comfort of the less privileged that is at risk because of future technology mm. nobody cares nobody's gonna care it, 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 it's it's so going to need massive disruption, right? That's the one point I wanted to add. With all the issues about climate change and AI, and yes, wealth distribution will help societies around the world, but we also have to consider, we are now in, a, in Singapore, a developed nation. How about nations who are not developed, who have uh, lower levels of power or access to the internet? They mm. wouldn't be educated about what climate change is all about, what AI is all about. So how can we get everyone on board when we are all at different levels, different mm. levels of power, different levels mm. of influence, different le levels of access to money, to technology? Well, in a way, I think, in a way, I'm pessimistic and optimistic here as well. I'm pessimistic because I agree with you. I think there's going to be a massive gap between uh, the more privileged nations, the more privileged populations on the reserve, and the ones that unfortunately are unprivileged and don't have the same level of information. On the other hand, I think there's also going to be a divide globally with mm. people who are willing to access information online, to get out of consumption mode, to educate themselves, to get on board with these new technologies, to develop these skills on the 21st century compass. Y you know, to develop all of these soft skills and ways to leverage technology for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said in the beginning, this is now available anywhere, anytime for anyone, right? So stories, let me, sh let me share a story with you that makes me optimistic about these kinds of things. I've been uh, at the Big Data World Conference uh, today and yesterday, a lot of discussions about data collection, analytics, and there was a great project there, which is called She Loves Data. Mm. which helps people who don't have a technical background, who don't have a data background, to get involved in data science, to become data scientists. And there's a couple of these kinds of projects, because there's a very urgent need on the market for more data scientists. Uh, one of them run out of French tech by uh, one of our colleagues called Datapi. He focuses on underprivileged populations. So he has a team of data scientists in Nigeria. Mm. These are 15, 16-year-old kids that have to walk to school for two hours every morning with nothing going for themselves except the fact that they have a computer, they know how to code, and they know what data is. Like These people, they can emerge anywhere, right? Because of technology, they can educate themselves anywhere and prepare themselves mm. Anywhere. But that's also because the startup that you're speaking to, they're aware that this is the gap that needs to be filled in countries where they don't have as much access to yeah, te true. technology. Yeah. Now, if these startups are not there, how are they going to access technology and information? I if it's not there, they, yeah. they don't know. They only know their localized problem, which is whatever tribal fights that they have, whatever corruption that's happening within, within their country. So it's great that we're talking about AI and climate change, but we also have to consider that we are at a privileged position where we have access to all this information. We can harness it. We are probably the labor behind building all these AR AI products as well. Right? AI doesn't right. Yeah, just yeah, come yeah, out that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, We're benefiting now, obviously. Yeah. yeah. But uh, th there's ways of looking at this that are even more pessimistic, right? I don't know if <laughs> you guys are up for that, but I could open a can of pessimism here. Um, <coughs> so what makes all of these uh, skills on the compass so special? They're all in our brain, right? So... I don't necessarily agree that they're all in our brain. That We might have that skill ah. nascent in us, but... 
in our lifetime experience, we might not have the opportunity to practice compassion, to practice critical thinking. I come from an Asian and Western education background. Right. No, yeah. no way I went through any critical thinking training in my Asian education background. Mm. So if I never gone through oh, it, I wouldn't know how to have it blossom within me. But because I also went to a Western education kind mm. of set, I was taught these critical thinking skills. So yes, we need those skills, but we also need to help people to access it, to practice yeah, it, I agree. to learn it and yeah. all of that. Diversity and preparation for the age of artificial intelligence. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Well, let's be let's be optimistic for a moment, okay? Cuz I tend to be pessimistic. So <laughs> so let's do the inverse. Let's assume that some of you still have jobs, right? Or clearly not us, but some of you might still have jobs. Um, so you work a lot with uh, companies, enterprises around issues such as um, uh, employee, employee engagement, career development, and career development, right? In that kind of context, it becomes a whole different ball game. Everything's changing. There's all of a sudden only half of the people are working. We don't do the same tasks. Mm -hmm. We yeah. redefine what it means to have a job. What does career development look like? I think it's fantastic. I'm a very optimistic kind of person and I know you're very <laughs> pessimistic, but I believe in the resilience of humanity that we have survived oh, millions okay. and millions of years of, I don't know, uh, comets hitting on earth and uh, whatever floods and earthquakes and things like that. If we can survive natural disasters, we can survive AI. And so, so is career development. So traditional organizations are typically quite hierarchical. You've got the C-suite, then you've got the middle managers, frontline managers, and staff. That's yeah. a typical organization. So the way that they've built career development is as such that for you to climb up the ladder, you need to gain certain skills. So to become a frontline manager, you need managerial skill or operational skill or something like that. And from frontline manager to middle manager, you have to have leadership skill or whatever kind of skills that they promote. It becomes fluffier and fluffier. Fluffier to the very top. Mm. But that is a great way to incentivize employees to work harder for your company and for them to target the next goal, the next rung on the ladder in order for you to reach right. a high level in the organization. But with AI and technology, all of that has changed. Mm. All of that has completely changed because you can have an organization that's completely flat. CEO, workers, that's it. So what kind of career ladder would you have? It's just one step. Yeah, it flattens, right? It, flat it, 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 it levels the playing field. It does. It does level the playing field. And mm. not only that, traditional companies used to sit all in the same office. We get to see everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now companies are completely remote. Uh, the more I speak to people in the startup, in the entrepreneurial space, the more I hear of companies not having an office, mm. not meeting their employees because they're based in, in South America or somewhere in the US and they don't see each other except on Slack or on Zoom. Or, or they have a, an office at WeWork. Or they have know. an office at WeWork, exactly. <laughs> oh, yay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So when the workplace changed because of technology, so therefore the way we develop our career will also yeah. have to change. Mm. So for my key point is it's no longer about climbing ladders anymore. Mm. And that's scary to a lot oh. of organizations. Mm. It's more about creating a mosaic of all these different skills that either you're interested in or passionate in or adjacent to what you're currently doing. So to bring this back to learning and, lear and, and like profiles, is, is mm -hmm. it a T-shaped profile? So someone that has a very broad skill set and one particular area of expertise that is mm. perhaps most adapted to these kinds of new career paths? Mm. The, I, I very much subscri subscribe to the idea of, of the T-shape, for instance. For me, the, 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 the compass is the, is the, is right. the, yeah. the bar of the T, right. but then you, you have to, d to dive deeper if you want to acquire some kind of expertise. Now, in terms of career development, I very much agree uh, with you. It will not be you know, a matter of going upwards uh, endlessly. What will be endless, I think, is learning. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the necessity, and for many, it's a pleasure. And I wish it could be a pleasure for everyone, because it's a wonderful thing, right? If we do it correctly, learning. For many people, unfortunately, who have you know memories of school in their mind? It it the the word learning uh, is 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 something that they just can't hear. But I think we can turn it into something uh, wonderful. So learning, there are technicalities to it, but there's a mindset that we have to make sure you know yeah. everyone has in them. Mm. And then yes, please. Ling -ling. Oh, I just wanted yeah. to <laughs> expand what what you say because 
growing up, we are educated. Mm. So, and this education system is developed by adults who think that, oh, as kids, we need to learn these skills, we need to learn these topics. So the children themselves, and even adults until now, because that's, yeah. we are the product of the education system. Um, children, they don't have a say about what is it that they have to learn. So mm. there's a difference between education and learning. Education is when someone dicta dictates, this is what you're going to learn, mm. and therefore you should learn it. Learning should come from your internal core, your sense of passion, your sense of curiosity, your sense of interest. If we uh, give ourselves the freedom and space to pursue our curiosity, that's where you mm. can find genuine learning. Well, I, I love that, and let me just add to that by mm -hmm. saying that also I think this whole attitude when it comes to learning, right, is also driven by the fact that as children, and still today, right, we wrote learn facts, mm. massive amounts of facts. Now there's science on that, right? You don't remember those facts. You reproduce them for an exam and you mm. forget 80% of them in a two week time span, right? There's lots of studies showing that it's completely ineffective and useless to learn these facts. Other than install some sort of willingness to do perform meaning f meaningless tasks. Mm. Especially in a world where we have access to the world's information on our phone, knowing where to find those facts, right, strikes me as much more important. And if it's more about education than it is about learning, then maybe people would have in new generations a much more positive mindset about lifelong learning and about enriching themselves all throughout their lives. Yeah. No, I think with Google, with all this technology that's going on, there's mm. not much value in memorizing and learning the facts because quite easily you could just pull it on like what does this yeah. mean what is this what happened this year and so on and so forth so therefore it's more important to to give ourselves the time and space to follow what we're passionate and curious about uh there's one point that you mentioned just now i don't entirely agree which is the t-shape mm. and the depth mm. Now, there is a danger to specialize yourself in one thing. I know friends who have been in organizations for many, many years, and they specialize themselves in that particular technicality mm. or whatever not. But if one day their organization no longer exists, it's hard for them to find jobs somewhere else because their technicalities and their speciality is so tied in into that organization, it's hard for them to bring that same knowledge right. to somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. So I've known people who have be become like an expert of this system. I am an expert of this system of 20, 30 years, and suddenly the company decides to, okay, I'm gonna change the system entirely. <laughs> yeah, their mm. sense of identity of being an expert in the system is gone. So where I believe is less risk is to pursue things that you are curious. I don't want to say passionate, because passionate has the implication uh. that it's you're monogamous. You only can be passionate about one thing. If I have passions, then it'll sound like you're being polygamous. So well, we're, follow we're French, your, so. your French. <laughs> it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Passions, yeah? Passions. <laughs> so it's good to have not just one speciality, but multiple specialities. Minimum two. And when you have mm. at least two specialities, a new form of career or a new form of job can come out of it. So there are some examples I can give you. One, one interesting one that I come across is AR, augmented reality artist. So you can be well-versed wow, in yeah. AR technology, but if there's a part of you that is, I, I want to be an artist, I want to create, you can combine that two speciality and therein hmm. lies a new job. There's just so much of that's potential to combine yeah, these things. That's very interesting. Uh, there's, there's a few other things I've written down here, which is a uh, e-sport athlete. Who would have thought playing games oh, would become yeah, an athletic right? sport at some point? You know, and you earn loads of money from there. And another one recently I've uh, read is about uh, organ and body part har harvester. That's a great job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let me explain what that means. Podcasting goes away. I'll jump right in. Especially yeah. in the medical field, it's very hard to wait for someone with the right organs mm. to be replaced in you. And now with 3D printing and with the right material, you can actually print organs there instead of waiting for an organ donor. That could be a potential mm. job in the... Uh, well, only if you're interested in 3D printing speciality and mm. organ donation. Right. I, I, I would I would add, uh, of course, if you have one single specialty and you are unable to move from it, it's risky for it sure. It is very risky. Right. But yes. in my mind, yeah. you need to have a very broad base in any case. Yeah. And then the ability to dive deep, but then to do it again and again and again as you reinvent yourself uh, 
every five or every ten years because we know that these jobs will change, some will disappear, some will appear, and we have to be able to cope with that. Mm -hmm. And we cannot only stay at, at a super superficial level, right? Yeah. So we need to have yeah. the ability uh, to learn even 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 hard things, uh, even if we change every uh, so yep. often. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. need depth as well. Exactly. We need depth as well. Five years. We need we need we need depth as well. And that's one area where I'm wildly mm. optimistic. I've, I mm. think we can attain depth much easier than we think. Uh, it's a matter of of wanting it, of grit, of work ethic, and of all the tools that we have at our uh, dispose dis th that we can use right now today, right? From yeah. wherever we are, we mm -hmm. can develop depth and we can change specialization every five years as you yeah, suggest. With, with the technology, with yeah. the latest learning methodology, it's actually much easier than you think. Mm -hmm. I've only learned to be a podcaster in the last two years. I and I'm considered expert. Yeah, I'm planning on yeah. becoming <laughs> a podcaster. So um, we've gone from pessimism to careful optimism, right? Let's end this with hope, if we can. Uh, so I think it was Niels Bohr uh, who uh, is properly misquoted as having said that uh, it's very difficult to predict things, especially the future. Um, so instead of a rather than asking you to predict the future, I'd like to ask you for your hopes about the future. And I'd like to ask you, Ling Ling, about w what your ideal future of work would look like. And you, Bernard, what your ideal future of learning would look like. Well, I can go crazy with this. I like it that you ask me this question because I, the future of work to me will be so crazy, in fact, that work will be shaped around us. Rather, we shape ourselves around work. So what I mean by that, oh. what I mean Love by it. that, we, we're already doing yeah. it now in terms of the remote companies, how we are in a remote teams and creating that kind of environment gives the individual the uh, ability to shape the work so that they can perform optimally, to take care of their personal things, and to also learn appropriately. So it's done, it's done in remote work. What will go beyond is that with technology, each individual will understand their strengths, their interests, their weaknesses, whatever it may be, and we will have technology to say, I've got this job from this company that suits your strengths, your weakness, your interests, therefore I'll uh, transfer this job to you and you can work in an environment that is optimized for your performance. What I also like about this kind of future is that it is inclusive. So meaning if you have certain restricted abilities, physical, mental, you still will have the ability to work because the work is shaped around you. So no longer will the individual will have to get education just to fit a job description. The job description will fit around the individual. Mm, very, very interesting. That's my hope for the future. I know it's a bit crazy, but I think we're going to get there soon. I saw a startup that focuses on this. I definitely share that hope. I think it's it's something really even to look forward to. I Me mean, as an entrepreneur anyway, right, who doesn't necessarily fit in traditional boxes, I would love this kind of future for myself at any rate. Yeah. So what about the ideal, your ideal future of learning? So look, uh, to start with, I love learning, right? <laughs> right. This must be clear. So for me... Uh, the ideal future of learning is more and smarter mm. uh, and more and more effective uh, learning. So what we really have to understand is that the current education, I'm going to use this word, system that we have today is very much an inheritance from the 19th century when it was put in place and it hasn't changed much since then. So then the objective was simply to feed the economy in a standard way with workforce that was educated also in a standard way and people would learn during their formative years, you know, until they were 20 and what they had learned at school would take them until the time they would retire or more likely until the time they would die because there wasn't so yeah. much re retirement. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, my ideal future of learning will be the result of a, of a triple transformation. First of all, in terms of what we are learning, it's a transformation that we have already witnessing, that's what we're discussing now. It's changing from teaching knowledge and Asian countries, France, etc. still focus very much on that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So changing from um, teaching knowledge to teaching those skills, sometimes some people call them 
uh, deep skills I heard in your podcast yeah, deep today, yeah. or timeless skills, they are all in the same realm. The second transformation is that we thought in the past, uh, as I was saying before, that education would stop when you completed school or university and you were supposed to be equipped for your entire life. It is not the case any longer. And this is why the concept of lifelong learning is really gaining ground um, in universities that are now focusing on this. There are, there's a bunch of companies that focus on this. Uh, corporates are also changing a little bit their um, take, you know, from an L&D of compliance we have to t tick the box to let's make sure people really learn. So from initial learning to lifelong learning. And the third transformation, which you also touched upon, is in the old days, education, or rather there was something even worse than education, it was instruction, right? So how does instruction work? You've got a teacher at the blackboard, it's the person who knows. Yeah, yeah. And the person who knows lectures and doesn't want to hear any single noise, except if they ask you to repeat after them. Road learning, repetition, exactly. etc. That's the old way. Now, learning sciences have made so much progress, and we know how learning can become effective. We know the, 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 the pillars of learning. There's a very famous uh, French um, psychologist, um, Stanislas Dehaene, who has described that very well. And in order to learn, um, you need to uh, pay attention, you need to be engaged, you need to have some feedback, and you need to have some consolidation. And even these simple notions change the way um, learning takes place. And in addition to this, now we benefit from a lot of technology that we didn't have in the past. You mentioned uh, augmented reality, so augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, mm. etc. And of course, artificial intelligence, which is so useful uh, in the field of learning, um, to personalize learning uh, according to your taste, according to your interest, according to your pace, according to your level. This is adaptive learning, and we owe this to artificial uh, intelligence. So, my dream, future learning, from knowledge to skills, from initial to lifelong, and from lecture to, I call that the modern arsenal you know, of learning. I love it. And I, I have to tell you, if AI facilitates these changes and you know, brings us to a future where these two ideal worlds exist, for me, that would just be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. OK, so maybe the conclusion is, you know, on a very French note, education is dead. <laughs> Long live education. <laughs> right? Let's be ahead. Yeah. Education. Off with their head. <laughs> 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 All right, so I'm, I'm going to wrap this up because we could keep talking for hours and I'd like to take deep dives with each of you separately into some of these issues because there's a lot to talk about. Before we take questions from the audience, I would just like to shamelessly plug, shamelessly because it's not my stuff to plug, um, so some of their stuff. I, I warmly recommend Bernard's book. Uh, I have to say, I think it's one of the rare books I've read on AI written by someone who isn't from AI that I like. Uh, I very strongly oppose people writing um, fluffy books on topics that they know nothing about because uh, it's the cool thing to do. This is a fantastic book and it really takes a deep dive in all of these issues that we just covered and I cannot recommend it warmly enough. Thank you. I would also recommend, uh, especially with what's coming, people, if you know what's good for you, to uh, <laughs> subscribe and listen to Ling Ling's podcast. So, um, I didn't tell you this, but uh, secretly Ling Ling is one of the fastest rising, the fastest rising female podcaster of Southeast Asia. She has an amazing podcast called Leaders of Learning. You find it in all the places where you can get podcasts. Please subscribe. And even if you don't, just share it with everyone you know, right? That sharing is caring. All right. Well, thank you both very much. Great having you here. If there's thank any you. questions from the audience, this is the time.